Okay, I'm going to start. Thank you all for coming. My name is John Bell, J. L. Bell, and I have a website called Boston1775.net. And today I'm going to tell you the story of the Boston bankruptcy that I think helped lead to the American Revolution. This is a story that starts in Boston in 1765. Now that was two years after the British Empire had won this tremendous victory over France. Everything was wonderful, the war was over, and naturally the imperial economy went into a depression. <laughs> because uh, at around the same time, the British government in London made an important change in how it administered its military forces in North America. And together, those, for those forces, the economic situation and the particular administrative uh, issue, I think, together, they led to the personal bankruptcy of one man in Boston named Nathaniel Wilwright. Wheelwright's financial failure that had a rippling effect led to the whole economy of Boston towering for a while. It is a credit crisis. And I'm going to tell that story and then I'm going to argue that that is part of the, what we have to think about when we think of the, the American Revolution. So going back to the war, during the war, national governments borrow a lot of money and pump it into the economy by buying things, by hiring people. And at the end of the war, Governments tend to shrink their military, shrink their government, shrink their employment. They may also try to pay off their debts, which might, which might mean higher taxes. And then you can usually affect the national economy or the imperial economy. And it is, has especially had repercussions on a regional economy that was already under economic pressure. Now, one of the ways the British government uh, it pumped money into the economy, especially in North America, during the French and Indian War, as we call it, was they literally sent money across the ocean, gold and silver coins to pay the soldiers. On a regular basis, or semi-regular, probably something like that to the soldiers, they got their money, they got cash, and they got hard, hard currency, specie as it's called. That meant that somebody had to send, had to collect all the silver and gold uh, on behalf of the British Treasury and send it to North America. And that was the job of paymasters and money contractors, as they were called. It was a sought-after position because as an incentive to do your job, you got to keep 2.5% of all the money you sent. Over several shipments a year, that means you were making a very good profit, and a steady profit. It was lucrative, even after administrative costs and insurance. During the mid-1700s war against France and Spain, now these are the wars that are called things like King George's War, the War of the Austrian Succession, the War of Jenkins' Ear. They're just constant wars against these other empires. And finally, the French and Indian or Seven Years' War. The commander-in-chief for the British forces for some of the time was William Shirley. Um, we have the people from the Shirley used to have it. Uh, William Shirley was uh, governor of Massachusetts, and he was, in addition, uh, head of the uh, British Army in North America, which meant that the wars were basically being run through Boston. Boston was the, British, the biggest British port in North America at the beginning of the, in the first half of the 18th century. But, uh, the, the, frankly, we still feel that we are the most important place in North America. But then the, we really were. And, but then its population, the population of Boston sort of stalled out at about 15,000, 16,000 people. Two cities to the south passed Boston in both population and in terms of importance and commerce. New York and then especially Philadelphia. And a lot of this was due to the geography. There were warmer ports. They had more land to expand. Boston was really uh, stuck on this peninsula. And Manhattan was a very much larger island. Philadelphia was on the mainland. Uh, Philadelphia was also more welcoming to immigrants than uh, Boston, the Puritan Boston. So already Boston merchants were seeing their preeminent position in North America, within the British Empire, slipping away. That was even the, that was by the mid-1700s, it looks like. So, uh, but with the war, with the war being run through Boston, it still felt like the most important place. The Army's money contractors were two men, Charles Apthorpe and his junior partner, Thomas Hancock. Apthorpe was a young British gentleman who had settled in Boston. He traded extensively. He married a woman named Griselle Eastwick, whose family owned these wealthy sugar plantations, slave labor plantations, in 
Jamaica. So they, he had a very good basis uh, for his fortune. Hancock was uh, a local man. He was the minister, uh, the son of a minister in Lexington. He went into book selling, but book selling at the time meant you were selling a lot of other things because you had a luxury clientele and uh, you were importing things from England. So he was just uh, doing a lot of stuff. He was also doing some smuggling. Apthorpe was said to be, when he died in 1758, the richest man in Boston. This is his monument at King's Chapel. Hancock, who died in 1764, well, we know what happened to his money. It went, he and his wife, Lydia, had no children, so he raised his bright young nephew, John, as his heir. And so it was the source, the money contracting for the British Army, as well as all the other businesses, eventually became the source of John Hancock's fortune. Let's go back to the Apthorpe family. Charles Apthorpe and his wife, Rizal, had many children, and their daughter, Anne, married a man named Nathaniel Wilwright in 1755. He was described as good-natured and friendly. He was especially active during the 1750s, redeeming captives from Canada, people who had been captured on the New England frontier by the French and Indian forces and brought up to Canada for ransom. Uh, he was also, while he was in Canada, he went up and visited an aunt named Esther Wilwright, who, uh, okay, I don't have a uh, picture of her here. She was, uh, she had been captured in a much earlier war. She had been converted while living with the Catholic natives uh, of uh, French Canada. She had become a nun. She was living in uh, Quebec as a uh, mother superior of a Catholic order, which to her Protestant New England family was just an act. And so they were sending messages, trying to get her to come back. And at one point, she was given a very large bequest if she would give up the Catholic Church. And Nathaniel Wilwright went up and asked him, you know, what, what did she like? But she was committed to the church. She remained uh, in the, as a nun for the rest of her life, which meant that Nathaniel got to inherit some of that money instead of it going to her. That's nice. Um, the Apthorps also had a, their oldest son was named Charles Ward Apthorpe. Uh, and Charles Ward Ethel and Nathaniel Wilwright became partner together in the next generation of the family firm. And they continued to do the money contract for the British Army after uh, Charles' father had died in 1758. Now, Boston at this time had no banks. It had no corporations. It had no stock market. The only way you wanted to, if you wanted to invest, there weren't just a whole lot of uh, possibilities. And the end of the war, one of the ways you could invest during the war is you could invest in privateer, but you know, as soon as the war was over, that was over. So one solid investment that you could make, if you had more money than you uh, wanted to keep under your mattress, uh, you wanted to make more money for you, you could loan money, you could buy Massachusetts promissory notes, the colonial notes. Uh, people loaned their money to the province at a designated lawful interest of 6% a year. They got printed notes. These are some examples from North Carolina and from Pennsylvania. They got printed notes which could circulate like money. You could give these to other people to pay off your debts. At the end of the year, whoever was left holding the note could go to the provincial treasurer and ask for the face value plus 6%. Uh, however, the Massachusetts legislature authorized the treasurer to borrow only a limited amount. In 1765, that amount was 138,000 pounds. The uh, wealthy, connected people, uh, the merchants, basically the elite, they were the first people to be able to get the, this crack at this uh, investment. So there really wasn't a whole lot to go around. There was a lot of unfulfilled demand for investment grade notes. So another way you could invest is you could go to a solid businessman and you could say, I will loan you X amount, and uh, will you promise to give me back uh, X plus lawful interest? That was a personal note. And who looked like a solid businessman in Boston? Well, Nathaniel Wilbright. 43 years old in 1764, he had these wonderful connections. He owned, he had the money contract. Uh, he owned Wilbright's Wharf, which is over here in this um, view of Boston by Paul Revere. That meant he was collecting rent from the berths for ships, for the warehouses, for the shops. He owned interests in ships himself. He was uh, owned 
uh, cargo, that he was trading back and forth with different parts of the empire. So people lined up to give widow Wright their money as an investment. Uh, as one example, in 1764, a widow named Margaret Vindenholm gave a uh, businessman named Arthur Savage 160 pounds. He went into Boston to, to invest this, to give this money, to loan this money to Nathaniel Wheelwright. Wheelwright gave back a personal promissory note with a note promising to pay the lawful interest, that 6% at the end of a year. Uh, here is an example of a personal promise with the promissory note. Uh, uh, print, it's a printed form with the details spelled out. This is not one involving Nathaniel Wheelwright. This involves another businessman named Josiah Quincy. Uh, Savage returned the note to the widow Benton. She used his money. She gave it to somebody to pay off her own debts. By 1768, uh, four years later, nobody knew where that note had ended up. It had just been passed from hand to hand like cash money, like paper money. According to James Otis Sr. of Barnstable, Wheelwright had, uh, ended up functioning like the banker general for the province and almost for the continent. So many people were using his notes as money. People well, took their money by thousands from the treasury to trust it with this man. So he was seen as an even better investment than the state, or at least a more convenient investment. Now, the problem was the Wheelwright may not have actually been that savvy a businessman. There's a story in Fred Simons' book, Witches, Wicked, Witches, Rakes, and Rogues, about how in 17, November 1762, a middle-aged woman from Bedford named Miriam Fitch came into town and told this other uh, merchant, named Christopher Clark, that for hard money, she could lead him to a place where there was a treasure chest, which she couldn't get to, but she could you know, sell him access. Clark was so excited, he went to Wheelwright, and he said, uh, I need cash to pay off this woman. Wilbright got all excited. He went to his neighbor, he got, uh, he had silver. She didn't want silver, she wanted gold, so he traded the silver into gold, they brought him. Uh, she led them out to this mill in Bedford and said, you can see down in the, in the cellar, that's where the treasure is, that, you can see that chest. And so the two gentlemen went in, and she locked the cellar and ran away. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, according to them, they might even have drowned. They were yelling for help. If, if the uh, uh, water had been let in, the floodgates had been opened, and the water had been let into this mill, they could have drowned. But they were let out, and they prosecuted uh, uh, the, the woman, uh, Miriam Phipps. She was caught and convicted and had to stand in the pillory. And Wheelwright and Clark returned to Boston. They were probably more than a little embarrassed. Although this, what, this story wasn't really in the newspapers at the time. It was told later. Um, in 1764, two years after that incident, Charles Ward Athorpe decided to move to New York. And he built a mansion in what was then the Manhattan countryside. Now this space is Midtown. And there's an apartment building in that room. As I said before, New York had become a bigger, busier port. Uh, furthermore, London, the London government decided to move its military headquarters for North America to New York. So, uh, the, because the Hudson provided better access to those new provinces in, uh, in Canada, better access to the western frontier, General Thomas Gage, the new commander-in-chief of the British forces in North America, he was stationed in New York. So if Aptor wanted to keep his government business, and of course he, most of his money was coming from Jamaica anyway, New York was the place to be. So in August 1764, he announced that he was dissolving the firm of Wheelwright and Aptor. And he asked in the Boston newsletter all the customers who had outstanding debts or outstanding credits with the partnership to come and settle with Wheelwright as his agent. Uh, around the time, Will Wright, uh, Athorpe reviewed Wheelwright's books, and they showed that Wheelwright owed Athorpe 80,000 pounds for the payment of the king's troops, and 12,000 on the settlement of the partnership, but that Wheelwright was owed up to 40,000 pounds from other people, his promissory note, and all told, he had 22,000 pounds more in assets than in debts, and by the standards of the time, that looked very solid until January 1765, when he stopped honoring his debts entirely and wouldn't come out of his house. <laughs> Governor Francis Bernard reported to London, this was like an earthquake to the town. Numbers of people were predatory, some for their all, everything they owned. 
Everyone dreaded the consequences. Lesser merchants began to fail. A stop to all credit was expected, and a general bankruptcy was apprehended for a time. The diary of a merchant named John Rowe preserves the day-to-day -day record of this crisis on January 15th. The trade has been much larger on this day. Mr. Wheelwright stopped payment and kept in his room. A great number of people will suffer by him. And so Rowe himself spent that evening at the British Coffee House talking about Wheelwright's affairs with other merchants and businessmen. I should note that the term coffee house there is just a uh, fancy word for tavern. Uh, on January 16th, the next day, a deputy sheriff detained Wheelwright for debt to a man in Braintree. Bathorpe demanded a full look at his brother-in-law's accounts. And the new, uh, the new accounting showed uh, that Wheelwright had assets of 176,000 pounds, which was a lot, except a lot of them were in uh, debts of sort of dubious nature, debts that probably should have written down because they weren't, he wasn't going to be able to collect them. He also owed his own debts, his promissory notes and other things, to other people of 178,000 pounds or 2,000 pounds more. So even if he had been able to collect all those debts, he still wouldn't have been able to pay off all his creditors at that moment. Uh, to put those figures in perspective, the total value of goods traded between Britain and North and, and all of New England in 1762 was 289,000 pounds. So he was, uh, his personal uh, debts and assets uh, were uh, about two thirds of all the trade between the mother country and the region. Now, all, all those, anybody can do the math, all those promissory notes that we had been passing out, the people had been passing around as money, they were now worthless. He would not be able to pay off those promises. They seem to have no value. And that caused this ripple effect, and other people admitted that they couldn't pay their debts either. One of the biggest losers was a new Boston selectman named John Scully. This is a, a portrait of Scully by John Simpleton Copley. It's a lovely uh, chalk and ink drawing that is now at the uh, Philadelphia uh, uh, Fine Arts Academy. Um, January 19th, Scully and two other businessmen had to shut their doors to creditors. This is five days after Wheelwright closed down. On January 20th, John Rowe consulted with the sheriff about legal action against Scully. So John Rowe was being helpful then. Uh, that was a Sunday, but he was still doing business. I mean, he should have been in church, but he said, he wrote in his diary, did not go to church, my mind too much disturbed. Too disturbed for church, not disturbed, uh, too disturbed to go and talk to the sheriff about uh, taking legal action against this man. On January 21st, Monday, young John Hancock, and he had just inherited his uncle business the year before, he was very new still, and he told his contacts in London, trade has met with the most prodigious shock. I would advise you to be careful who you trust. James Otis Sr. compared Wheelwright's failure to the South Sea bubble in 1720. It was that level of uh, disaster financially. Widows and orphans that are ruined can only go in the winter fate, he wrote. The more resolute have been hauling and hauling, attaching and summoning to secure themselves. And attaching and summoning meant going to court, uh, putting in lawsuits, uh, putting it, taking out writs against the people who owe you money. Then, if you got them into line first, you would be paid before the other creditors. It was really uh, it was a free-for-all. Shopkeepers started to add new language to their advertisements. You can see this in the newspapers. All persons indebted, either by bond, note, or book, are desired to pay to prevent their being brought to suit in April court. Craftsmen offered discounts to anybody who would pay with hard money, gold or silver, instead of credit. On January 22nd, the Massachusetts House fast-tracked an act for the more equal distribution of the estate of absconding debtors among their creditors to cut down on panic and losses so you didn't have to be first in line they could do something more orderly to figure out where the money should go. The House also proposed uh, a lowering the lawful interest from 6% to 5%. Uh, now, the, law, the House is the lower house of the legislature. The upper house, the council, well, those were the gentlemen who had first crack at the Massachusetts bonds. They were the investors. They didn't want to lower their interest rates from 6 to 5%. So there was an argument between the two houses of the Massachusetts General Court. In February, Wheelwright's biggest creditors went to the legislature with a new idea, that to protect him against all civil suits and processes, 
for up to six months when he put his affairs in order. And the House rejected that idea for special treatment. But that was how uh, desperate people were. Within weeks after that, Mule Wright left Massachusetts for the Caribbean, leaving his children behind. In early March, the legislature finally ironed out a compromise bill on bankruptcy. There was a new process based on New York law. This was actually a very important reform. But and by the end of the month, John Scully had entered into that process. He announced first in a newspaper ad that he was willing to surrender up all his assets. He was making a public declaration that he was bankrupt. A probate judge then appointed three trustees from the business community to oversee the dispersion of his uh, assets. And they advertised a meeting, again, a public announcement, advertising a meeting of all of Scully's creditors and the coffee house in April. In November, they oversaw an auction of Scully's goods, including all his household furniture. He had household, lovely mahogany furniture and things like that. He had two slaves who were sold off to pay his debts. It took years, but eventually he regained his financial standing and his post as selectman. He was remembered for decades and decades as uh, in the name of Scully Square. Uh, we will write by this point, but beyond the reach of Massachusetts law, but his property wasn't. In July, his creditors secured a warrant to attach his estate and because he was an absconding or concealed debtor. He was not in the position to do what Scully did, to make the announcement, to stay in town, to try to work this out uh, in an organized fashion. There was, again, an auction and a meeting of creditors. The new law required all those advertisements in the newspaper, which gives us a very good record. But that means that if you read the newspapers at the time, you'll see all these uh, bankruptcy advertisements, all these uh, auction advertisements. The ripples continued to spread. Um, one historian counted 58 formal bankruptcies between March and October 1765, 77 more by February 1768. The Boston Evening Post, they would usually run a list of the uh, burials and baptisms each past week. They added burial, baptism, and bankruptcies in Boston on the past week. Uh, in November, the New Hampshire Gazette sort of was the Boston newsletter contained old news and spoke very little else except 15 bankrupt advertisements. In June 1766, Bostonians learned that Wheelwright had died of yellow fever in Guadalupe. His old minister, uh, the Reverend Henry Kainer of King's Chapel, was looking after his oldest son. Another was living with the widow, Rizal Apthorpe, the, the boy's grandmother, and the youngest was with an uncle. What a dispersion of a late flourishing family, Kainer lamented. So this was the end of not just the Wheelwright fortune, but the Wheelwright family as a, uh, that Wheelwright family as a unit. Uh, Charles Ward Apthorpe ended up controlling most of Wheelwright's property from New York. And you can see down here that what was Wheelwright's wharf was in a 1769 map called Apthorpe's wharf. Uh, now, a lot of locals, we were in Boston, we, we do uh, directions by where it used to be places and what <laughs> things used to be called. So a lot of people still called it Wheelwright's wharf. Uh, but it was owned by Charles Ward Apthorpe. He had, as I said, he had this solid foundation for his fortune in uh, Jamaican sugar and rum so that he uh, was uh, safe from bankruptcy, and that provided a certain foundation for the economy, uh, that were the, the, what used to be the Wheelwright and Aptor part of the economy. The Wheelwright, and Aptor, uh, the Wheelwright bankruptcy still had a big effect on politics, uh, however. As his agent in Boston, Aptor chose a British-born hardware merchant, man from uh, uh, Wolverhampton, named William Molyneux. And in the late 1760s and early 1770s, Molyneux, who he appears to have lived off the Aptor income, the income from managing properties for Aptor in New York. And that allowed him to become very politically active. And he was very politically active on the Whig side. He was a leader of the crowd. He was a really pushing the non-importation boycotts and the other protests uh, and uh, opposing new taxes from London. He was actually one of the most radical of the Boston patriots. He sank a lot of money in the early 1770s into a public works project to uh, employ poor women spinning and then weaving and making cloth. So he had a lot of money invested in looms and spinning wheels and things like that. 
Um, wasn't necessarily his own money. That was the problem. Part of it came from the, from the town, but also probably part of it came from Charles Ward Apthorpe, who meanwhile, he was in New York. He was on the council for the royal governor. He was on the Tory or loyalist side of this political conflict. So when British troops came to Boston in 1768, uh, Apthorpe insisted, Mal Malino had been one of the most vocal people against having troops come to Boston. Apthorpe insisted that Molyneux rent space on Apthorpe's wharf to make into barracks for these same troops. Uh, meanwhile, an another aspect, another conflict of this, uh, stemming from this bankruptcy, uh, probate George Thomas Hutchinson, who would soon become governor of Massachusetts, he chose a gentleman to administer Wheelwright's estate, uh, sort out the remaining assets and creditors, and we don't know why, but for some reason he chose Dr. Joseph Warren, a young physician, uh, very energetic. Interestingly, Dr. Warren's mother, widowed mother out of Roxbury, had been one of the people who had to go bankrupt in the late 1760s. Um, I don't know if this was a conflict or if it uh, might have given uh, him more of a uh, uh, sympathy for people who were undergoing the bankruptcy process. Dr. Warren, as we know, also became much more politically active over the late 1760s and into the 1770s. So this meant that Molyneux was representing Apthorpe and Apthorpe's economic interests, and Warren was representing Wheelwright's estate and its economic interests, and they were potentially at odds. But we don't know of any direct conflict between them, but it might have been awkward. Uh, in the fall of 1774, General Gage, I had come from New York to be governor of Massachusetts, as well as military commander of uh, the Army in North America. And his second in command in New York, uh, General Frederick Haldeman, sent him a letter in French with secret news. Charles Ward Apthorpe was coming to Boston to audit Molyneux's books, to audit uh, what Molyneux was doing with his Apthorpe's property. And soon after that event, we don't know what happened during their meeting, but soon after that trip, Molyneux took to his head. And on October 21st, Dr. Warren examined him and left some medicine. And the next day, Molyneux died. And loyalists insinuated that he killed himself with Dr. Warren's laudanum in order to avoid the disgrace of being exposed as an investor. Now, that was just one rumor. The Patriots had their own rumor that Molyneux had been poisoned by British officers. But in any case, that's why we don't remember William Baldwin, because he died in October 1774, before the revolution really started. He was an incredibly important person in the Boston protest up until that point. Uh, as for Dr. Warren, he was still wrestling with this horrible, complicated uh, estate for uh, Wheelwright uh, the next year when he went uh, off totally into politics and became uh, head of the Massachusetts Provincial Congress. And then, uh, was going to be commissioned a major general and went to Bunker Hill and died. As late as April 1782, newspapers were still running ads for all of Wheelwright's creditors to come and meet at a tavern to work out his affairs. It was still complicated. It was still uh, all mixed up. That same year, 1782, the Massachusetts legislature finally authorized a bank in the state. And that provided a different way of thinking about credit, of thinking about investments, the, the, the more for what we are used to today. But all that with Warren and Molyneux and that complication, I don't think that was the biggest effect of the wheelwright bankruptcy on the American Revolution. Why I really think that it led to the American Revolution is that you have to go back to May 1765, when bankruptcies were spreading, when this new law was in place, and uh, these newspaper ads were uh, showing people uh, uh, declaring bankruptcy and there were lawsuits and all this. What else happened in May 1765? Well, in that month, the American colonies learned that Parliament had passed the Stamp Act. Now, this was designed to move money, gold and silver, from the, to the imperial capital, from the colonies, from everywhere that it applied, so that Britain could pay off its national debt from the war. The law placed a small price on newspapers, on court filings, which was exactly what everybody needed, by law, needed to uh, use in this fiscal crisis. In other words, just as people in Boston were starting to get terribly worried about their financial health, 
and the financial health of their society and uh, the economy of New England. The Stamp Act promised to make life more expensive and money harder to obtain. And that must have made, I think, that made people feel even more anxious and even more resentful. And if, I don't think it's any surprise that the first public protests against the Stamp Act, the first wide-based protests, appeared in Boston in 17, August 1765. And those were also violent protests. There was a lot of passion involved. And they involved crowds, not just the elite anymore, but uh, they had uh, children marching. They had small merchants. They had shopkeepers marching. Those protests eventually spread up and down the Atlantic coast. They provided a unifying force for the anti-crown forces in all these different colonies. They provided the impetus to stand that Congress. This was, I think, the very beginning of the American Revolution. And I don't think it would necessarily have been that passionate, that immediate, that uh, angry, if people hadn't been worried about Nathaniel Wheelwright and his bankers. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions or comments or feedback? Yes, sir. Um, what was the date that you mentioned when uh, Boston opened its first bank? Or when was the date that Boston opened its first bank? Uh, it was authorized to open in by the legislature in 1782. It took two more years before it actually opened in 1784. Okay. Uh, and the um, it, for quite a while. Uh, different, as that bank was absorbed by different things, different other banks and bigger, they would keep using the since 1784 underneath uh, their. Uh, so I think the last bank that used that was uh, Bay Bank, and uh, then it came Fleet and Bank of America, and they no longer uh, trace their roots all the way back there. But that was the root of the Massachusetts banking industry was the Massachusetts Bank of 1784. Um, when did uh, institutional banking replace individual individuals' making funds? Like when did it really take hold in Boston? When did individual banking replace? Um, and that I'm not. I couldn't say for sure. Um, it's what it would be in the early republic. Uh, but what replaced it was this system where paper money was issued by banks, and therefore uh, the value of the money you had in your wallet depended on the strength of the bank that had provided it and how far away that bank was, i.e. the convenience of getting it redeemed for gold or silver. And so uh, it was just an incredibly complex system. I, I'm, I'm baffled that people could actually live their lives that way. And that lasted uh, until the late 1800s. And when uh, the federal government began to insist that only it could issue uh, such, uh, such money. That was a big change that was very controversial at the time. But that's the system that we have all grown up with now, and we're all used to it, and we all think it's the, just the, the most logical system in the world. Um, it, for a lot of people, the idea that, okay, rather than depend on the credit of this distant government, I will depend on the credit of my neighbor, Mr. Wheelwright, seemed like a better bet. <laughs> yes, sir. When the colonies could uh, coin their own money and hard cash and when they couldn't? When could colonies coin their own money and when they couldn't, and this is talking about gold and silver? Yeah. Uh, in the late 1600s, Massachusetts actually uh, issued some copper coinage. Mm -hmm. uh, by this period, by the mid-1700s, they weren't supposed to. It was only supposed to be the imperial government in London. Um, because the value of gold and silver depended on the actual weight, however, a lot of the coins that were circulating in uh, the British Empire were actually Spanish coins because the gold and the great gold and silver came from Sp the Spanish Empire. So when we talk about the dollar or the history or all these other um, uh, terms, those actually refer to Spanish coins. And the, uh, the species that people would use uh, was probably minted in Spain, not in London. But the inability to coin money was one of the real problems. That's why there was so much reliance on credit. Well, it wasn't that they, I mean, the problem was there wasn't any gold or silver to coin. <laughs> um, the, the, yes, it, it, there was this great crunch in the colonies uh, for gold and silver. And so uh, whenever they needed to pay taxes, 
especially to the London government, they needed to actually get out of their credit with their neighbors and their global shopkeepers and find a way to get gold and silver to pay those taxes. And that did provide a, an ongoing headache and resentment. Um, this was especially acute, I think, at the top level of colonial society because those government were not were spending more than they made. <laughs> And that, you know, that is bound to make the, any sort of problem of getting gold and silver even worse. Because if you're, uh, uh, if you're trying to trade in your tobacco or your other goods and they just aren't uh, bringing you enough money, enough credit from your London merchants as you hoped, then it's just going to be worse when you also have to uh, get real hard currency to pay your bills locally. Uh, yeah, what happens with the, the paymaster position? You know, when the emperor goes to New York in '64, I mean, does, do the payments to the British officers come through New York to back to Massachusetts all the way through the occupation? Yes, yes. The, at that point, uh, this is about how did the British our army deal with its uh, payment system? Uh, when the when General Gage moved the headquarters to New York, uh, the paymaster job was. Uh, based in New York, and then there were local paymasters. The, the money would uh, be paid out by uh, the paymaster in New York to uh, the colonels of the different regiments, and the regiments, the adjutants, would be paying it down to the individual soldiers. Uh, and there is uh, both at that time, because the army was smaller, it wasn't such a big system, but during the uh, actual war, this was a very elaborate system. It was even more difficult for the Americans because for the first few years of the war, they were printing the money and then hauling it around. And then the, that money became worthless. And fortunately, the French began sending money. But you can, there were lots and lots of stories of uh, people during the war ferrying these chests of gold from one part of the colonies to another in order to pay the army. Anyone? Yes? So imagining that you are an everyday Bostonian pre bankruptcy and you're going about your everyday expenses, are you likely to be using these Tom Sorry notes or are you more likely to be using something else? You would likely be running tabs at the various shops that you regularly patronize and every quarter, every three months, you would be trying to settle up with the shops. And when that settlement came, Yes, at that point, you would be trying to pass off the, the promissory note uh, or uh, the state currency. Um, there was also there was the old tenor and the new tenor. There was money that was issued by the state before 1760 or so. Was it a different value than the money uh, or since? It was, as I say, it was incredibly complex. And um, a lot of people let a lot ride until uh, they were moving or somebody died, and then they had to settle up all these estates. And it was, uh, that was part of the job of administering or executing an estate, was just to figure out who out there owed money and who out there uh, was expecting to be paid from this person. Um, and it was very much a credit economy. Um, and that meant that when, that's why something like this, which was only one man, could affect everybody because everybody was depending on everybody else to be able to pay at a certain level of, um, of certainty. And suddenly, that wasn't going to happen. Um, when I think of a credit economy, I tend to think of you know, a lot of trade and barter for goods and services going on. Is that the case as well? Well, it, it could work that way. If you were going to a shopkeeper and buying uh, shoes, then uh, you could also perhaps make a deal with the shopkeeper's wife to sell her cheese. And at the end of the quarter, you figure out, OK, who, who would supply more cheese, who would supply more cheese. So, and that worked, I think, better at the, t at the town level, where everybody knew each other. Uh, in Boston, there were many more uh, shops and many more, uh, and more, more transient population and things like that. So there's a bit more of a need for a formal system of uh, based on uh, on money, on promissory notes, on uh, actual coinage, and things like that. Okay. Well, thank you very much.